break His broken heart to clear His place For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles Every knee will bow gates, make way before the King of Kings. A God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? can stop the Lord. Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. is roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Every knee will bow Okay. Good morning, Orchard family. Welcome to worship. We're the Michael Isaacs. I'm Erica. Yes, I'm Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. Yeah. Um, yeah. All, right. okay. All right. Good morning, Orchard family. Welcome to worship. We're the Michael Isaacs. And I'm Erica. I'm Matt. <laughs> this is Please! <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right, this one for sure. This one for sure. Oh my Ready? God, Ready? Go, go, waiting. go, go. Hey, good morning, Orchard family. Welcome to worship. We're the Michael Isaac family. I'm Erica. I'm Matt, and this is Lenny. We're so glad that you guys are joining us for worship, and we can't wait to see you guys in worship. Uh, now it's time for you guys to take out your phone, send some love, send some texts, and we'll hopefully see you guys soon. Bye! Bye. My name is Christina and I'm the kids director at the Orchard Church and I just want to take a moment and say hi to all of our kiddos. We are so excited that you have chosen to stay connected with us during this time and watch our service as a family. So we have this moment just for you. So now that I've said hi, I have a question for you. What do you think about my hat today? It's cute, right? So hats can tell us a lot about a person. The kind of clothes we wear can give a clue to some things about our personality or what we do. So I'm wearing this hat today just because I think it's cute, but I thought it would be fun if we played a little game. 
So today, Wendy is going to talk to us about the kinds of clothes that Christians should wear. And so we're going to play a game where I'm going to show you a picture of a hat. And I want you to tell me what kind of hat it is and what that hat tells you about the person. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. So our first hat that we're gonna look at today is this hat right here. What kind of hat is this? That's right, it's a police hat. And a police hat is worn by a police officer. And we know that if someone's wearing this hat that it's their job to protect and serve and that's a safe person. Okay, here we go to our next hat. And let's see, we have here a fireman's hat. So what does this tell us about that person? That tells us that a person is going to put out fires and help keep us safe. Okay, I've got another kind of hat for you. Are you ready? Here we go. This hat is a cowboy hat. So if someone wears a cowboy hat, we know that maybe they're really into Western style or they could be a rancher or they could have a farm and that hat helps keep sun off their face when they work outside. Okay, and we've got one more kind of hat for you. And I think a lot of our dads are gonna know this one too. Are you ready? Let's check it out. Okay, this is a football helmet. And so if someone's wearing this hat, that lets us know that they are playing the sport football and they, the hat serves the purpose of protecting their head, which is pretty important in that game. If you've played it before, you know. So why are we talking about these hats? Well, those hats are physical hats, meaning we can touch them, we can see them. As Christians, people know who we are based on what kind of hat we're wearing. And I'm not talking about a hat that you can see like this, but an invisible hat. And when we show these qualities, we let people know that we're a Christian. So in the book of Colossians, the qualities that show we're a Christian are kindness and humility and mercy and patience and most importantly, love. All right, my friends, I would love for you to choose what kind of invisible hat you're going to wear today to let people know that you're a Christian and go ahead and put it in the comments. Even better, take a picture of it and tag us in it. We would love to see what kind of hats you're gonna wear today. Okay, my friends, my part of the service is done and it's time to move on to our next thing. I love you and I miss you and I cannot wait to see you again soon. Christina's out. Bye. Good morning, I'm Nick Nixon. I get to be a connection coordinator here at the Orchard. I gotta tell you, during these times, it's very tough to connect. I miss you guys so much, and I long for the day that we can be together and worship again and, uh, and see each other face to face. I pray that God is seeing you through this well. As, as I've said to many of you, I pray you're sheltering nicely and, uh, and God's answering your prayers. This morning I want to read a passage to you that you may be familiar with. It is called the Widow's Might or the Widow's Offering. It's found both in Mark and the book of Luke. But I'm going to be reading from Mark this morning. In Mark it says, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched his crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others that are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, gave everything she had to live on. I believe this story is often misunderstood. See, I've heard some folks think, say that they think that it's God wants us to give everything that we have. I don't believe that's true. I believe what God wants is surrender. You see, here was a woman who was in need of receiving charity, receiving the help from the church, but her heart was such that she wanted to give. God commends giving in faith. Jesus wanted his disciples to see, and I believe he wants us to see today, that the widow's heart is how our heart should be. A heart full of faith in Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. A heart filled with love of our God and of our neighbor. 
and a heart filled with hope outside of ourselves, longing for rescue that comes only from the Messiah. We're all called to give generously, even sacrificially. But what matters is the spirit in which that giving is done. So as we prepare to give this morning, and of course during these times, we, we give online, we give through text, we give through uh, mailed offerings. So it's, um, it seems a little different, but the truth is we're still worshiping God with our gifts. So I challenge you to ask yourself this question. What truly motivates your giving? I pray that it's because we give ultimately into the hands of a God who knows us and who has provided all that we need in Christ Jesus. May you be blessed during these times. Would you pray? God, I thank you that you indeed provide everything we need. I pray that you give us a widow's heart, God, that we would give in faith to you, God, knowing that you are the great provider. Every perfect gift has come from above. Everything we have has come from you, God. As we give a small portion of that back, I pray that our hearts would be moved, even changed, that we would honor you, not with writing a check, but with the spirit of our giving, God. We pray you would bless us, you would care for us, and you would heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey Orchard family, Paul Russell here. I hope everyone is doing well, and I hope that no one's gotten sick of their spouse yet. Just kidding. In all seriousness though, I hope that everyone's doing well, remaining healthy and staying positive throughout this whole COVID-19 situation that we're dealing with. To me, I always try to find silver linings in most anything that I do. And one of the biggest silver linings to me out of this whole situation so far has been the fact that we've all had to slow down. Think about what you were doing pre-COVID-19, probably sitting in the car in traffic or at the office behind a desk staring at the computer screen or running the kids from one practice to the other. Think about what you've been doing ever since we've had these stay at home orders. You're probably instead of sitting in traffic in the car or sitting on the couch watching a Netflix movie with your family or sitting at the table and having a nice relaxed dinner as opposed to rushing through so we can get to the next thing. Or even that time that you get to spend with your spouse on an evening walk that you didn't normally get to take. To me, these are the biggest things, this quality time that we're getting to spend with each other and the fact that we've slowed our schedules down. This is the silver lining to me so far in all of this. And my hope is that us as a community, as a country, and maybe even the world are able to take some of these habits and behaviors that we've learned throughout this crisis, despite the tragedy and despite the fact that we've had so much uncertainty, we're able to take these wonderful things that we've learned and apply these habits and behaviors to our post COVID-19 lifestyle. I think that these are the things that not only will enhance our lives, but enhance the lives of everyone around us. So I challenge you now to take a moment each day, as we continue this journey to get to the other side of this crisis, sit down for a minute and think about what silver lining you can find. Hi, and welcome again into our home. We're so glad to have you here. One of my favorite rooms in our house is actually my dining room. And what I love about that room is that it's filled with treasures for my family and memories of time spent around the table. In fact, that's what I love the most about the dining room. 
when we're able to have family and friends over and we gather around that table and we laugh and we talk and we tell stories and we enjoy good food. I sure do miss that and I look forward to the days when we can do that again. But right now in this upside down world we're living in, our dining room has been transformed. It is currently being used like a high school classroom and also my office and also the catch all for things that we need. In my dining room is where I'm preparing sermons and I'm caring for people's pastoral needs and I'm, I'm thinking creatively and it's become this whole other space that I'm using and it's kind of a mess. But I'm trying to make peace with that and recognize that using this room for a multi-purpose is serving a greater purpose than my need for everything to be neat and orderly. We are three weeks into a sermon series called Letters of Hope. And during this sermon series, we are examining and exploring and reading together four books of the New Testament. They're not really books, actually, they're letters. They're letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. And what all four of these letters have in common is that Paul wrote them while he was in prison. Now imagine for a moment being in prison. Uh, if it were me, it would be all about me and how hard things are for me and how difficult it is and how unfair it is. And I would be raging crazy. But Paul, even in prison, is thinking about and caring for others. And in these letters, there is such an, a, a, a huge amount of care and compassion for people and for churches and for others. The letters that we're examining together are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. The first three were written to churches, to small communities, and Paul writes these letters as a way of uh, instructing them about what it looks like to follow Jesus. The book of Philemon is a little bit different, and we'll be examining that next week. It's a letter that Paul wrote to one individual, but it has so much good stuff for us to learn from. What I appreciate the most about these letters is not only Paul's heart for these churches and for other people, but they're so practical. And they're so helpful to us, even all of these years later, in terms of what it looks like to follow Jesus in the everyday, ordinary life. And so each week we're examining a different book and I'm picking just my favorite passage from the book and kind of sharing that with you and talking with you about it. But throughout the week, I'm inviting you to dig a little bit deeper and to read the entire book with me. Most of them are four or five chapters. They're easy enough to do. So to help you dig a little bit deeper, we're providing a reading plan for each day that comes with some reflection questions. If you would like to receive this week's reading plan, just click like on the comment below that has to do with digging deeper and we will get that reading plan to you after worship is over. Today we're reading from the book of Colossians and what makes Colossians different than Ephesians and Philippians, which we've already looked at, is that Paul is writing a letter to a church that he didn't start. Not only did he not start this church, he's never been there, he doesn't know these people personally. The man who did start the church was a co-worker of Paul's and he has come to visit Paul in prison. And when he visited Paul, he kind of unloaded on Paul about all the struggles and the difficulties he was experiencing in this new church he was building. His primary struggle, the primary thing that was impacting the church was that false teaching and cultural teachings were kind of getting mixed in with teachings about Jesus. And so the message of the gospel had come, become kind of confusion, confusing and cloudy. And so Paul wanted to address that and decided to do so in a letter. So as you read through uh, the book of Colossians or the letter that Paul wrote to this church, you'll see that he highlights how important Jesus is. You see that he clarifies any question or doubt that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, that He is the one that came to save us. It, it, throughout the book of Colossians, Jesus is kind of lifted high and exalted because Paul's trying to correct, correct this false teaching that has kind of infiltrated into the church. One of the other themes that you'll pick up as you read through this book is that Paul is emphasizing the difference between life before Jesus and life after Jesus. 
In other words, doing life with Jesus changes you. And that's what I love the most about this particular book, is that, that it reminds me that salvation or the gift that Jesus gives us isn't, about, isn't only about being saved for heaven. It isn't only about eternal life. When Jesus saves us, he also saves us from ourselves. That doing life with Jesus changes us and that we don't have to be who we've always been. And that when we walk with Jesus, when we follow Jesus, he is in the business of changing lives and changing hearts. And that's what I love about the book of Colossians. In fact, the passage I want us to look at today comes from the third chapter. And Paul, in the opening of the chapter, he's kind of laying out life before Jesus. And then I'm going to read about life after Jesus because I'm convinced life with Jesus is always more better than life without Jesus. And so we're going to pick up at the 12th verse in the third chapter, and I will be reading from the New Living Translation. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Welcome to my closet. Those are words I never imagined myself saying in a sermon. Yet, here we are in my closet. I love how Paul takes something so familiar, so ordinary, so relatable, like putting on clothes, and uses it as a way to teach us a little bit more about what it means to follow Jesus and what it looks like to build our lives on Jesus, not just on Sundays, but day after day after day. When you give your life to Jesus, when you make a decision to follow Jesus, when you open your heart to the love of God that is revealed to us through this Savior who came and gave himself for us. The scripture tells us that you are given a brand new heart, a brand new life. That is good news. If you don't know this Jesus, if you've never given your heart over to him, I pray that today would be the day because life with Jesus is really so much better. And if you aren't sure about scripture, take my word for it. This Jesus has transformed me from the inside out. And I long for that for you. That's a little freebie there. What I really want to say to you is that when you follow Jesus, when you open your heart to him, not only does he give you a new life, he gives you a new wardrobe to wear. Now, the thing about this wardrobe from Jesus is that it's, it's new. So in order to make room for the new, we have to be willing to let go of the old. And although our old clothes feel familiar and they're well-worn and they fit us just right, they aren't necessarily what's best for us. And so Jesus entrusts to us, Jesus gifts us with this new wardrobe that we have to choose every day to wear. Let me review for you Paul's description of this new wardrobe. It is made up of things like mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love, and gratitude. I want you to say them with me, just like we're in church together, so that these words would sort of settle in on you, so that you would really own these words and understand that this wardrobe is one that Jesus is inviting us to wear every day. Mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love, and gratitude. Let me share with you just briefly three observations I want to make about this wardrobe, about this new wardrobe that comes from Jesus to those of us who decide to follow Jesus. And the first observation that I want to make is that this list of attributes, this, this list of characteristics, they're beautiful and they're going to make us more beautiful people. But the reality is this, these new clothes aren't for our benefit. This, these attributes, these blessings, these gifts of how we treat other people really are about relationships and how we relate and connect and treat the people that we love. And so as we put on these new clothes of Jesus, the clothes of mercy and gentleness and patience and forgiveness and all that good stuff, 
the blessing of those isn't necessarily just for us. I mean, you'll look good in these things. Everybody who's kind looks more beautiful, I'm convinced. But the purpose of this new wardrobe is for the benefit of others. And when we put on the clothes, when we put on the clothes of Christ, it makes us better parents. It makes us more faithful as spouses. It makes us loyal employees. It makes us amazing friends. So this attributes, these 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 descriptions of what it means to follow Jesus, well, these make us better at living in community with one another. And isn't it interesting that so often when we think about our own wardrobe, it's what makes us look good and what fits us right. But these attributes are really for the benefit of the people that you live with, that you do life with. The second observation I want to make about this list, about these attributes, about this, these new clothes from Jesus is that they don't come naturally, at least not to me. Now, you may be full of mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness and love and gratitude all the time, and it may come naturally to you. But for me, these are decisions that I have to make, not only in the morning, but throughout the day. I find it very easy to extend these gifts, these blessings of mercy and kindness and patience, although patience is always a hard one for me. But I find it easy to extend those to others when things are going well. But when I'm overwhelmed or when I'm stressed or when I'm afraid or when there's conflict or tension or miscommunication in a relationship, these are not my go-to. In fact, what I usually do to is revert to my old ways, to the old clothes, to the ways that look out for me, the ways that protect me, um, for the ways that really are not of Christ. And so even though I know these attributes, these descriptors of the Christian life are for me, I also recognize they're not my go-tos. They're not my natural instinct. And maybe you can relate to that as well, that this list is beautiful and wonderful and I want to wear these clothes every day. But I also have to acknowledge that I don't and it's hard. And making the choice all the time requires so much. The third observation I want to make about this list of attributes is that it sounds a lot to me like Jesus. In fact, if you were to create a list on a piece of paper or on your phone or somewhere um, of all the attributes, of all the characteristics of Jesus, I'm convinced that this new wardrobe of mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness and love and gratitude, my guess is all of those would make the list. That what we find in this list of attributes that we as followers of Jesus are to take on is really a reflection or description of Jesus himself. And here's the reality. I'm convinced that we cannot give away something that we haven't first ourselves experienced. And so in order for us to be people of mercy, we have to know and experience mercy. In order for us to be kind, we have to experience the kindness uh, of Jesus. In order for us to be humble, we have to see and recognize and know the humility of Jesus. In order for us to extend gentleness to others, we have to recognize and experience Jesus's gentleness to us. And oh friends, the amount of patience that Jesus has with you cannot be underestimated. See, I think that this list of attributes is really something that we have to experience from Jesus before we can um, put on those clothes for ourselves. We have to receive it, we have to put it on, and then and only then are we able to give it away. So what do we do then with this instruction from Paul? this instruction to put on these new clothes and to wear them every day and decide every day to be people who love like Jesus. Well, friends, I want to share with you something that has been probably the most helpful thing I've ever learned as a follower of Jesus. And I've been following Jesus for a good 30 years. And here's what it is. We are transformed to be like Jesus Not because we try hard, not because we work at it, not because we um, strive to be more loving. We become like Jesus because we spend time with Jesus. And that this whole um, new life isn't just instantaneous, that the new life Jesus offers us is actually a process. And it's a process that takes our entire lives. 
And it's a process that happens not because we work the process. It's a process that happens because we spend time with God. It's a process that happens because God does something inside of us through the power of the Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us that we cannot do for ourselves. And I, over the years, have exerted an incredible amount of energy and effort in trying and striving to be more kind or more loving or more patient. And what I've discovered is that I become those things as I spend time with Jesus and as I invest in my Christian walk. We become like the people we hang out with. And so I want to spend more time with Jesus so that I become more like Jesus. And I want to spend more time with people who love Jesus and hang out with Jesus so I become more like them as they're becoming more like Jesus. See, if you keep reading in chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17, Paul really describes for us what that process looks like and how we participate in the process. I wish I could tell you that it happens magically, that when you give your life over to Jesus, there's this like fairy dust that sprinkles down from the ground and all of a sudden you become this list of amazing attributes that that God instantaneously, like an instant pot, makes you merciful and kind and hum- humble and gentle and patient and forgiving and loving and full of gratitude. But really, it doesn't work that way. It's more of an ongoing, everyday process. And in the rest of this chapter, Paul explains how the process takes place. So let me share those last two verses with you. It's verses 16 and 17 in chapter 3. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you say or do, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. See, in these few words in these two verses, Paul is really describing the practices of the Christian faith. He is reminding the church and Orchard reminding us today that as followers of Jesus, we have to participate. We have to practice the practices of our faith. Just like you invest in your relationships with the people that mean the most to you, as we invest in our relationship with God, that relationship grows and deepens. And as that happens, the transformation takes place inside of us. And we become more and more comfortable with this new wardrobe that Jesus has provided for us. So I know it feels a little bit awkward right now because we're not in the same building together. But the church is made up of people, not a building. And so as people who follow Jesus, as people who have committed our hearts and our lives to Jesus, we practice the practices of faith in our homes, uh, in our circles, over Zoom, on Facebook, whatever means we find possible for us to do the things Paul instructs us to do, to get to know Jesus, to let the teachings of Jesus settle in our hearts, to learn and teach and listen to one another, to sing the songs of faith, to to lift our voices in praise and to give God thanks for all the things that God has done for us. And as we practice those practices, I promise you that over time, this gradual change will begin to take place in your attitudes and in your heart and in the way you respond and relate and interact with other people. I long for us to all be people who become comfortable uh, in this wardrobe that Jesus offers to us. Not only because I think it will make us uh, experience more peace and and the peace that surpasses all understanding that we talked about last week, but also because it will transform our families and our community and the people that we interact with. Because this wardrobe not only is to bless us, but to bless others. And so church, as you seek to live into your faith in the next week, I pray that you will make some time and some space to practice the practices of your faith. And I know it can be super challenging, but There are so many tools these days that make it easy. Find a praise song that speaks to your heart and just play it over and over this week. Spend some time reading the reading plan as we jump into the book of Colossians. Call a friend and ask them what Jesus is teaching them right now so you can learn from them. 
Pray. Talk to God as you go about your everyday life. Um, open the Bible. I mean, there are so many ways we can do this. And as we do it, then the work of transforming our hearts, of getting rid of the old to make room for the new, well, then God does that hard part. And we, we get to experience the blessing that comes from that. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for not ever giving up on us. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world to save us from our sin, but also to save us from ourselves. Thank you for the hope of knowing that we don't have to be who we've always been and that you are a God who is still about the work of changing lives and changing hearts. So God, be with us this week. Help us to practice the practices. Help us to make space and room for you in the midst of what is these days so that your spirit, God, can change us and make us more like Jesus. So that together, God, we can love you and love others and love this world in ways that bring change and hope and transformation and love. May it be so in us. May it be so through us by the power of your spirit, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. Yeah.
be reading a letter today from Jackie and Stan Downing. It is for the people of the Orchard Church, about the Orchard Church. We've been attending the Orchard Church since Easter 2002. I grew up in the Methodist Church and Jackie grew up in the Baptist Church. We had not been attending regular service for several years and we're looking for somewhere where we could fit in. A few days before Easter, we received a card in the mail. Had two little girls on the front, one whispering to the other, had you heard? It was from the Orchard Church. And we decided that we were going to go that Easter Sunday. We drove around and around trying to find the church. When we finally discovered that it was being held in the middle school where our five children had attended. Our experience of church that day was different than anything we had experienced in the past. We met some very nice people. The pastor may or may not have made fun of my tie. And we have been comfortable with the Orchard Church since that very first Sunday. We fell in love with the Orchard. What we love about the Orchard Church is the love that is shown to people, the love that you show to people. The music is outstanding and brings joy about Jesus. The grow groups are wonderful and we get to learn about Jesus. Our pastor, Wendy, is awesome in her sermons. She always gives her heart and soul whenever she preaches. We hope that we continue to grow and spread the word of God and the good news about Jesus. Jesus is always with us and wants us to be like him, loving and caring for those around us. Think about what Jesus and God have done for us. God sent his son for our sins. It takes the whole body to keep the church going so that we can worship Jesus. It takes the worship team, it takes the hospitality team, the landscape team, and the whole congregation working together to be able to keep the church going and welcome everyone that walks through that door on any given Sunday. We're going through hard times right now with this whole COVID-19 virus. But we need to pray every day. We don't know what's ahead for us in the future. People are losing their jobs. Loved ones are losing their lives. It's hard. It's sad. But just keep praying to God and keep praying that everything is going to work out. And that there's a rainbow ahead at the end of all of this. Let us keep reading the Bible every day and thank him for his blessings upon us and his love. We will get through this and be better than we were. We will pray for all of our church people and love all of you so much. We've come closer to God and Jesus just by being involved with the orchard. We are certain that God, who began this church, through those who gathered with Ben in that middle school, is still working to make us flourish and let us continue to grow new and fully devoted followers of Christ. A short prayer. Dear God, thank you for this church. Thank you for all of our friends, our pastor Wendy and her family, our staff and the church leaders. Thank you for all of the great memories we have of the orchard. Please watch over us, guide us and keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Blessings to all, and remember that God is in control. He loves us and will always be with us. Love, Stan, and Jackie. And I want to add that on that personally. I hope that everyone stays safe. I hope that you all stay positive. Look for that silver lining. And I can't wait to the day that we're all able to be together again for that handshake, that hug, and that hello. Until that day, stay safe and I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. It is always a good thing when the people of God get together to tell this amazing story of Jesus' love for us. As you seek to be faithful followers of Jesus this week, may you spend some time with Him, giving Him the space and the permission He needs to transform your hearts to make you more and more like him, especially in the way that you love. May it be so in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and let the church say, Amen. See you soon, friends.